to the Michigan Business Beat, brought to you on the Michigan Business Network. I'm Chris Holman, and uh, we are here kind of remote in the studios that is concealed in the garden level of my house. Uh, but we're going all over the mid-Michigan area, as a matter of fact, because we have uh, six women who are in charge of the region, and we're going to expose them as today. Uh, actually, recently recognized by the uh, Lansing Regional Chamber of Commerce as uh, new executives of influence in the area. And uh, let me introduce them. And uh, everybody, give a give a little Queen's wave when, when I call your name. Uh, Helen Johnson, Sparrow Eaton Hospital. Very good. Very good. Cindy Kangas, uh, Capital Area Manufacturing Council. All right. Nicely done. Uh, Michelle Lance, Greater Lansing Food Bank. Good to see you in your new facility in the back. <laughs> uh, Julie Pinkston, the Greater Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau. All right, and Carrie Rosengana, who's uh, head of Capital Area Michigan Works. And finally, Nicole Noel Williams, who's in charge of getting people in and out of Michigan here by running the, uh, the Capital Region International Airport. So welcome, mm -hmm. ladies. Thank you all so very much for being here. And I think we'll just kind of go down the line and have you kind of um, maybe introduce your organization. So uh, Helen, it might be, uh, might be good to start with you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I love any time that I can spend with these beautiful ladies, very influential, um, very graceful and, and happy to be part of their company. Um, so I work for Sparrow Wheaton Hospital in Charlotte, Michigan. Uh, very excited to take this opportunity. I came here in January and, and joined this 25 bed critical access hospital that is servicing the Eaton County area. And we have a full breadth of services and we are just reached our two year integration mark with Sparrow Eaton. And um, just so excited about the, the breadth of resources that that affiliation and integration has brought to our community. Well, Helen, it's good to have you on board. Congratulations on that position. I, I have a long and storied history with Sparrow. I was on their systems board for about eight years and used to listen to the updates from your, your organization out there. It's good to see it in your hands. Thank you. Angus, Capital Area Manufacturing Council. Hello, yes, I am the executive director of the Capital Area Manufacturing Council and it's been about six months for me on board and I'm really excited. Our council is a membership organization and we are comprised of manufacturers in Ingham, Eaton, Clinton, Livingston, and Shiawassee counties. And we're growing. Manufacturing is strong and I'm proud to be a part of it. Well, it, it, it absolutely is growing. It is back with, uh, with, with its famed glory of the past, certainly. Uh, Michelle Lance from the Greater Lansing Food Bank. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us all. Um, so I work at the Greater Lansing Food Bank. I like to say that I work for everyone else in the community, which is the way I view my servant leadership. Um, we cover seven counties. We go from the tri-counties down here around the Lansing area all the way up to Clare and uh, Shiawassee to the east. Um, and we provide about 8 million meals to our communities uh, every single year. Uh, and that is growing, of course, because of the pandemic and um, all of the economic issues that people are facing right now. Yeah, and I might say the backdrop there is your latest facility, which is a marvelous one. Talk Thank about you. that. Yeah, yeah. So the community really pulled together uh, to raise the money for this new building so that we could serve more and more people um, in a quicker way, also serve various communities. Um, so if you think of all of the culturally relevant foods that we need um, to, to be able to, to uh, for everyone in our, in our region, who is not necessarily um, what we would consider, you know, the in need of the typical types of food. Um, so for example, we have a lot of refugees from Afghan coming in right now, Afghanistan, um, and we are working to provide culturally relevant foods for them for their regular diets. Um, so we're doing our work in very different ways and that requires a bigger, um, more innovative facility. Well, and I think your, your, your new facility is quick access to the expressway. So with the expanded areas that you're taking care of, that's probably a pretty essential thing. Mm -hmm. Julie uh, Pinkston, Greater Lansing Convention Visitors Bureau. I can't think of anyone who came into a position at a worse time than you did. Well, thank you for bringing that up, Chris. That's a great way to start. 
but thanks for having me here today. Yes, I am the president and CEO of the Greater Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we are privileged to be able to promote this area for tourism and really to impact the area's economy. I did start my leadership role here on March 11th, and then the entire industry I represent shut down on pretty much March 13th. So it's been a trial by fire, but as someone who's been here for 28 years and grown through the organization and grown through this community, have great resources throughout um, that were built up that there was no better time, in my opinion, for um, me to find that opportunity to, to lead our visitor economy here. So happy to be a part of this group and be with you today. Thank you. And of course, the, the compliment side of the intro is that you were so creative and did such a wonderful job. I mean, you found water in the desert and it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah, whoever thought that we would promote things that never existed before a pandemic, like eating in igloos and getting out and about on patios. So we we were the resource not only for our visitors that did still come to this area, but also for our residents and really made um, valuable connectivity to provide resources within the community. And that's where we're positioning to stay as well. So it's not just about visitors, it's providing our local businesses that connectivity into the community. Julie, are they coming back? Are they steadily coming back? We are slowly coming back. Um, you know, MSU coming back to campus has helped a lot. Meetings are starting to take place. Um, we've constantly had sporting events, the amateur sporting events take place. So we are slowly coming back into business, but uh, it's slow. But that's also compounded by the workforce issues, which I know speaking next would be Carrie, and that's a perfect segue. <laughs> we're, and we're all going to get your opinions on that in just a second, because that impacts all of us. Carrie mm -hmm. Rosengana, Capillary Michigan Works, and you're right, this is a great segue to Carrie, who is in, uh, in charge of putting people who need people and people together. So Carrie, as the, uh, as the new director of Capillary Michigan Works, why don't you explain to everybody kind of what your organization does? Sure, so thank you. Thanks again for having me and I'd echo what my peers are saying. It's really great to be here with all of them. We have a really strong connection in the work that we're doing. So Capital Area Michigan Works is a workforce development agency that provides services to both employers as well as the job seekers. So we work with individuals throughout the tri-county region of Ingham, Eaton, and Clinton counties. We have a business services team that has been supporting our employers throughout this interesting time that we've been having for over a year and a half to try to locate the talent that they need. And then conversely, we're helping those job seekers to ensure that they have the skill sets that are necessary to be able to connect with those opportunities. So it really is that supply and demand of people um, that we're helping to facilitate through our agency's efforts. And I became CEO in July. So it was like Julie, an interesting time to transition in the world of workforce development, but also like Julie, I've been a part of our agency since 2007. So having that long history has been really um, of great service as I've stepped into this role to help us transition and pivot some of the way that we've traditionally provided our services. Well, I have to say you're you're in a long lo litany of, of great leaders there and nobody lost a step when you came in. So congratulations on that. Nice job. Thanks, um, Ellen, let's go back to you and and let's let's ask the simple question. What's your greatest challenge that you're going to be looking at in the future? I have a feeling we all maybe end up having the same answer. Um, I think the the greatest challenge we're going to face in the future is just the, the pace of change, the dynamic nature of the workforce, and our ability to pivot very quickly and react to whatever that change may be, whether it's a pandemic, or it is worker shortages, or it's supply shortages. Um, every one of those things affects every one of the ladies and every business that is listening to this today. Um, because even if, even if the pandemic was gone tomorrow, I would still have staffing issues, I would still have supply issues, and I would still have, I hate to tell you this, the next pandemic that's coming around the corner. So um, with international travel and all of the things that we see, um, the world is much smaller than it used to be. Yeah. So things that are happening over there are, are going to be here shortly. So um, I would say that's probably what keeps me up at night. Pace of change keeps up everybody, I think. 
pace of Which change. Is why we're working all the way till midnight now. Yes. Uh, I want to run back to Nicole Noel Williams uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I want you to introduce the airport. You know, I was on the board for so long, I forgot that not everybody knew everything about it, right? Right, right. Thanks, Chris. Um, great to be here uh, with you today with all these wonderful women, these these new leaders in the region. And and I, too, started during the middle of the pandemic. So I've, I'm a little over five months into being the CEO for the Capital Region Airport Authority. And this is one of the things a lot of folks throughout the community isn't aware of, that we actually own and operate the Capital Region International Airport, as well as Mason Jewett Field, and then maintain a port of entry <clears throat> into the mid-Michigan region. So everyone thinks of a port of entry as, you know, being right on the border where ships and freighters are coming in. Well, what we provide is those opportunities to be able to put those containers that are on those ships within truck or rail, bringing them here to Lansing, and we can actually clear international products right here in Lansing. So as Helen mentioned, this international travel and how that's going to impact this, uh, not just this region, but the United States, it's opening up those doors safely so we can get folks back to traveling and um, business travel is the core of the Lansing Airport, um, as well as our UPS operations. Uh, we do have seasonal service to Cancun and Punta Cana. So we add some, some fun leisure uh, services into the mix as well. But, and, and you know, as I've come on board, it's that continuing development of, of land. And how can we make sure we're providing the warehouse manufacturing space that's, that's of need throughout the region? You know, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because talk a little bit about uh, the free trade zone, uh, which which because we have a lot of manufacturers out there. Yeah, so. yeah, it's it's um, the ability for products to be able to be brought right here into Lansing, and we're able, whether it's a foreign trade zone, a bonded warehouse facility, a container freight station, we have the foundation for international development. We've built this, and now it's time for us to build upon it. And it's really working with our corporations. We're bringing on a new director of business development that will be out working with corporations, working with Cindy, especially connected to the manufacturing side of how do we help educate current manufacturers and their logistics leaders and how are they shipping products today um, I know for ourselves we've got multiple products or projects that are working on here in the airport that are delayed because of products being tied up at the borders um, I've got a whole area I'm waiting for seating to come in at the airport to provide that more club delta club lounge type experience here but I won't have the seating until January so and a lot of this is due to logistics right how do we get these products in better and that's where Cindy and all the manufacturers in the region help provide that support. I'm going to swing by this afternoon, and drop off some camp stools. Okay, very good. <laughs> very good. All right, let's go back to uh, to Cindy Kangas. Uh, and tell me a little bit about your greatest challenge ahead. Well, I I think um, manufacturing has been going strong, and manufacturing never stopped during COVID. As a matter of fact, when I took my job, a lot of the manufacturers said if I could knock down a wall, I could expand, or I could easily buy. Um, another space and make my business bigger, but the workforce has been a problem. And as we chatted about supply chain has been a real issue as well. So they're right on the verge of going to that next level, but there are some frustrations just because they need the bodies. And I think um, also the state is kind of rolling out this industry 4.0. And so all of the manufacturers right now are keeping an eye on um, technology and what's coming next in technology and the staff that they need to kind of fuel this technology and the robotics and how to make all of that work together amongst all the turbulence. So it's been an exciting time to be a part of manufacturing, but there are definitely a lot of frustrations that I'm hearing because everyone's ready to, to move forward. And there are just a few things that are holding us back a little bit. Well, it's nice to know they're poised for the growth. We hope that gets here quickly. Excellent. Michelle Lance, uh, other than the exponential growth that you just experienced with the new facility, what, what do you see ahead as your greatest challenge? So very similar to what Helen and uh, really everyone else is expressing, Cindy, especially with manufacturing, um, the, um, the two things, really, the amount of employees that we can attract and retain. Um, so from what I am, am experiencing, the driver shortage that the entire universe, and especially in the United States, is seeing um, it affects our business drastically in two ways. One, we need to get product to us. So we have large semi trucks that are hauling the food to us. Um, and then number two, we have drivers on our staff team that take food out to the communities. 
And without drivers, uh, it's really hard to move that many millions of pounds of food um, all the way up to Claire. Uh, so that's going to continue to be a challenge for us. Um, the other thing is we're seeing that food cliff again right now where um, because of shipping um, and a little bit because of production as well, uh, we just don't know if we're going to be able to get the quantities of food in a couple of months that we're going to be needing. Um, fortunately, because we have a big warehouse, we have a lot still in store uh, right now uh, to get out to the community. Uh, but we're already seeing truckloads of USDA products, for example, that are being canceled um, because they can't get the food um, that they need to get out to the food banks. Um, yeah. So again, workforce and then um, shipping, you know, shipping, receiving. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Julie Pinkston, uh, I know you've got 10,000 challenges ahead of you. What, what, if you had to put one out in front, what would it be? So... I guess our biggest challenge right now is uncertainty of on every level. It's that I think we're preparing our 2022 business plan and it is the exact same conversations we had a year ago of how do we do this? Will people be willing to do that? You know, will people come back to a big conference? Not yet. So we're now having this conference discussion for this year. Will we get our big conventions back in 2022? We're not sure. That's a really big piece of this economy for visitors when you look at downtown Lansing and you see you know all of the state workers still working from home which is a big issue but you also don't see thousands of convention goers walking around downtown either and so those two things doubled um, are, are all based on uncertainty of the when the how when does this ever change or does it not and I think that's where we're making some modifications to understand what is that new reality of a meeting? No one wants the virtual. Um, that's pretty determined, but they're not coming back to the meetings either. So we can't hold meetings outside very effectively. So, uh, and then obviously I will echo everybody that that is the biggest challenge, but workforce has gotta be right there with it. So I already touched on that, but it's just, I think in our industry in particular, we're the first to shut down and we would be the first to shut down again. And that people are nervous then to reemploy within our sector. So that's a, a education challenge and a, an ongoing thing that you know people are surprised when they go to a hotel and they see the general manager picking them up in the shuttle van. Like that's how the staffing level is right now. And people are surprised by that. It's like, no, this is how we've got to take care of our guests and make it happen. It's all hands on deck. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because you went through a period where you had to shrink because of the lack of market demand. Mm -hmm. And now you're slowly having to gear back up. So that must present a bit of a problem, too. Yeah, we immediately took our staff to five individuals from 28 and we are back to 18 right now. So that has been a nice uh, change. Everyone was temporary furloughed um, until we had to make hard decisions to have a few not return. But um, yeah, so everyone's doing different roles here within our own organization, including myself. Things that you know that I thought I could shed when I became the CEO, but I'm like, nope, I will <laughs> I take out the trash like everybody else. <laughs> you go. I'm I'm there to help if you need me. I know you um, are. Nicole, uh, Noel Williams, I wanted to run back to you with the airport because it, it, it has been exceedingly difficult for um, medium and smaller airports to compete in this world. And uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure you get a lot of support from carriers in that regard. Um, what's your plan for that? Yeah, we talk about passenger travel and business travel and getting people back into these conferences, as Julie was mentioning, it's it's getting people back to their offices as well. So there is a need for that travel component to be brought in. And one of the biggest challenges for mid small size type airports is really the lack of, of um, pilots. So you kind of go back to the industry as a whole and you've got this um, 65 retirement age uh, for pilots and then not enough pilots coming into the system. So the new pilots that are coming in are really feeding those smaller community airports. They're putting in 50, 70, 90 seat aircrafts. 
and they're moving so quickly into the system, they're already working for the majors um, in a very short period of time. So, you know, as Carrie knows, it's one of these ongoing issues in trying to get people trained in the appropriate positions that are now here and available. And uh, we've got some great relationships with Delta, United, and American Airlines. They've been great partners with us. We're working on opportunities to bring back the services to the level we were at in 2019. So basically, it looks like first quarter of, of next year, we'll be exceeding the amount of seats in the market from what we had available in 2019. So we're slowly seeing a return, but we got to continue to see this pandemic ease. And, you know, as mentioned from Helen, there's a probably another pandemic. There's going to be another challenge down the road and making sure that we're positioning ourselves to have the right level of service that meets the demand and need from this community. But it all goes back to using the services here. We're like a small business, right? We're maintaining a facility, make sure it's safe, secure, and clean. And our airlines and car rental companies are all running small businesses. So they have a choice of saying, I'm, am I going to operate my flights out of Lansing? And it's not just moving to my neighbors, it's moving across the country. So it's important that we look at the kind of the bigger picture of how this impacts us down the road when people make that choice when they're booking their tickets is, is we're asking folks to, to revisit and fly Lansing. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And people don't realize the economic driver that it is. The, the community would not be the same without an airport. A lot of factories would, would move out. Um, Helen, we're going to go back to you because I want to run around the room real quickly and ask each of you. you your new CEOs, you're, you're, I hate to use the old phrase, you've been drinking from a fire hose for a little while. Um, <laughs> any words of advice for anyone following in your footsteps? Um. The words of advice that I would have would be um, find a support group like this, you know, make sure that you have those those people that you can call um, being able to react in a really volatile and dynamic uh, situation is is critical, but making sure that you're able to pause, make good decisions and then move forward. Um, I, I think that that's uh, the key to being a good leader. Excellent advice. Cindy uh, Kangas? I found that it's important for me, especially to stay hungry, always find someone that's coaching, teaching, and mentoring me. Um, I, and I also to pay it forward, always to be advocating for that next generation, the, 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 the kids that are coming down the talent pipeline that need those manufacturing jobs, just to find people to advocate for. So you kind of get that warm fuzzy as part of your job. The ones that will run us tomorrow. Michelle. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. So I think my best advice would be that just know that at this point in our history, there is no roadmap for what we're facing or what we will face. Um, so I think, you know, maybe in past generations when there were, was leadership transition, um, there were occasions that the mentors that we would have could help us usher in, uh, you know, our new era. Um, and with the last 18 months, it's just showed us that, you know, even, even if there are those mentors there, they're not yet going to be even really sure um, what to do next. And so remain creative, remain innovative. Um, don't pretend that you have all the answers and rely on your team members, your, especially your leadership team members um, to come in with uh, with wisdom as well. You don't always have to know the answers as the leader, um, but surround yourself with people who are unlike you in skill set, um, temperament, all of that to um, to round out you know what you can bring to the table. Get everybody's perspective. Don't waste a brain in the room, right? Exactly. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Julie Pinkston. Uh, I would actually build on what Michelle said. She was reading my mind a little bit here as she was speaking because I can't think of how many times I've been asked in the last you know year and a half, how, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to do that? And I was like, you know what? I really don't know, but let's talk about it. Let's think about it. Let's be creative. And that teamwork has been um, very valuable to me with our great team here. Um, but also to build, as I use the word build, is that I had so many connected connections in the in the community based on my role previously that don't make sense necessarily for my industry, but made sense as way to build community and way to get our message out strongly. And so to always like reach beyond your networks of what might be traditional or what might make the most sense 
I think when we all locked down during the pandemic, you went to your core industry connections and people that you relied on, but boy, the others have really helped me along the way, including this fabulous group right here. Excellent. Yourself included and yourself included, Chris. <laughs> oh, that's so kind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Carrie Rosengana, if you could, and I, I, I hesitate to say this, but we, I've got about one minute left, so, and we've got to get to Nicole, so. I can be quick. So what I would just say is don't feel like you have to have all the answers right away. Um, it's okay to take a step and pause and approach things from a logical standpoint and perspective and to tell your team, I don't know, because sometimes showing that vulnerability and letting them know that you're all in this together can really help with that camaraderie within your team. And I think that's really critical for retention right now. So I'll leave it there. Excellent. Nicole? You heard a consistent message, collaboration. You know, how do we how do we work together and how do we, you know, as highlighted, how do we bring in different aspects, different points of views to help support us? And Chris, you've been one of those for all of us that are on this call. And we can't thank you enough for all your support, your leadership in this community, your ability to step up and help support us in, in every way. So thank you, Chris, for for all that you do for this region as well. Well, that's too kind, and I, I have to tell you, I look forward to serving under all of you ladies, because you're gonna be you're gonna be running what's happening out here. Thanks so much for joining us. Continued good luck and thanks for what you're doing for the community. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Watching this on the Michigan Business Beat on the Michigan Business Network. I'm Chris Hall.